Now, U.S. intelligence has said that the capital of Afghanistan, Kabul, will fall to the resurgent Taliban within six months of the departure of U.S. and international troops. The development comes as U.S. President Joe Biden is scheduled to meet top Afghan leaders Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah. So what will happen to the people of Afghanistan as the U.S. prepares to pull out all its troops by September 11th? Welcome to We On World is One. My name is Priyanka Sharma and on this weekly broadcast of the We On VOA co-production, we'll try and answer some of the critical questions about the future of Afghanistan. So let's begin. The U.S. troop withdrawal from Afghanistan is more than halfway finished, yet the country is plagued with violence as the Taliban extend its reach and makes new gains. This as the Afghan president meets with U.S. President Joe Biden. Voice of America's Carolyn Prasuti reports more from the White House. Take a look. Gunfire heard in the distance as the Taliban take control in Afghanistan's northern Kunduz province near the border of Tajikistan. The situation in Kunduz is very bad. It is insecure. There are so many wounded victims in the hospital. The Taliban advances as U.S. troops leave with the firm deadline of September. So far, the insurgents have overrun 60 districts. That was the topic in Tuesday's United Nations Security Council debate. Most districts have been, that have been taken surround provincial capitals, suggesting that the Taliban are positioning themselves to try and take these capitals once foreign forces are fully withdrawn. In this exclusive interview with VOA, Afghanistan First Vice President Amrullah Saleh says the Taliban have gained confidence in the absence of U.S. forces. Well, they have this fake uh, conviction that they have defeated the foreigners and it's a matter of defeating the Afghan forces. So the hurdle for the U.S. is getting the Taliban to the peace table. That will be on the agenda when President Joe Biden meets Friday with Afghan President Ashraf Ghani and the High Council for National Reconciliation Chairman Abdullah Abdullah. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki says they will discuss how we can work together to ensure that Afghanistan never again becomes a safe haven for terrorist groups who pose a threat to the U.S. homeland, how we can work together to continue to implement uh, the humanitarian assistance, other assistance. Former U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan Ronald Newman says Friday's meeting is symbolic, but also more than that. It is important that both Dr. Abdullah and President Ghani are coming together. I think this is a very important and visible sign of unity that is very much needed in Kabul. The U.S. is providing more than $266 million in new humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan as it exits its longest war in U.S. history. According to the U.N., 18 million Afghanis are in need and nearly 5 million are internally displaced. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News at the White House. To speak about this further, we're now being joined by Voice of America correspondent Amy Hybels from Washington. Amy, welcome to Be On World as One. Tell us about the type of arrangements that the United States is making for the Afghans who work for them during their two decade long deployment. This top is, topic is expected to be addressed when U.S. President Joe Biden sits down with Afghan President Ashraf Ghani in just a few hours here at the White House. Now, on Thursday, President Joe Biden told reporters that Afghans who help the U.S. military are not going to be left behind. He made that promise as the administration is stepping up its efforts to prepare to evacuate thousands of Afghan interpreters who assisted the Americans during their nearly two decades long war in Afghanistan. Now, a senior administration official tells the Associated Press that the planning for this has been accelerated in recent days. This is an effort that they're working on to relocate the Afghans and their family members to either to either countries or U.S. territories while their visa applications are being processed. We're also learning that the administration intends to carry out the evacuation later this summer, probably sometime in August. That, according to another official familiar with the deliberations that are going on, both officials told the Associated Press that the administration has not yet settled on a country or countries for this temporary relocation. Evacuating Afghans to a U.S. territory could also further complicate matters. This is an issue that's being very closely watched here in the U.S. right now as 
Evacuation planning could potentially affect tens of thousands of Afghans. And U.S. President Joe Biden has come under recent, recent pressure from U.S. lawmakers and from veterans to evacuate the Afghans who helped the U.S. military during their operations, not just the interpreter, interpreters, but anyone who was working to assist in the U.S. efforts in that country. Right now, Amy, another very important aspect in all of this, Turkey has offered to guard and run the airport in Kabul after NATO's withdrawal. Tell us more about this development. Sure, Priyanka. On Thursday, U.S. officials actually traveled to Turkey to have talks about this very issue. As you can imagine, having a secure airport in Afghanistan is really important in terms of having missions over there that are operating once the U.S. and the NATO troops pull out. And of course, that deadline, as we know, is coming up on September 11th. Now, according to Reuters, Turkey has offered to guard and run the airport after NATO's withdrawal and has been talking with the U.S. about logistical and financial support. Turkey has been guarding the airport in Kabul for six years under agree an agreement that it had worked out with NATO. Turkey's defense minister said this week it does not plan to send additional troops to, Af to Afghanistan to secure the airport as it already has a presence there. And no decision has been reached yet on this matter. Right, Amy, thank you for these updates. Stay with us on this special broadcast. We'll come back to you for another story coming out of the United States. Let's now move on to some vaccination updates coming from the U.S. Now, the U.S. will not meet President Joe Biden's goal of partially or fully vaccinating 70 percent of adults by the July 4th Independence Day holiday. The White House announced this week the same. The U.S. officials are now focusing their vaccination education efforts on Americans who remain skeptical about the vaccine. VOA's congressional correspondent Katherine Gibson has more. Take a look. In the U.S., COVID-19 case numbers are down to the lowest level since March 2020. But those encouraging numbers are coming as the White House announces it will not reach an early July goal of vaccinating 70 percent of all American adults. One problem, younger Americans. The country has more work to do, is particularly with 18 to 26 year olds. The reality is many younger Americans have felt like COVID-19 is not something that impacts them and they've been less eager to get the shot. The White House has announced Tuesday that 70 percent of Americans over age 30 have been partially or fully vaccinated. And while the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says vaccination rates have increased in communities of color in recent weeks, U.S. lawmakers say more work needs to be done. We will not reach the goals in many states and communities if we do not continue to address the hesitancy, misinformation, and other issues holding back Americans from getting vaccinated. We have to continue increasing access and addressing barriers which make it hard for people to get vaccines, especially for people of color. And with nearly half of American evangelical Christians saying they will not take the vaccine, one theologian told lawmakers that hesitancy has a worldwide impact. And at the global level, American evangelical culture is highly influential in parts of Asia and Africa. We're already exporting our misinformation and fears to the rest of the world, especially via social media. Even with 20 to 30 percent of American adults unvaccinated, U.S. officials are optimistic there will not be a fourth surge of the coronavirus in the U.S. this winter. I don't think even under those circumstances that you're going to see things like a thousand deaths uh, a day. I think that is a bit much. But there is a danger, a real danger, that if there is a persistence of a recalcitrance to getting vaccinated that you could see localized surges. And as the U.S. was working to raise its own vaccination rates, the White House said earlier this week that its goal of sharing 80 million vaccine doses globally by the end of June is being complicated by logistical challenges. Katherine Gibson, VOA News, Washington. the vaccination drive in the United States. We still have Voice of America's Washington correspondent Amy Hybels with us on this broadcast. My next question for you, Amy, what steps is the Biden administration taking to try and increase the vaccination rate in the country? Well, Priyanka, they're doing that by lots and lots of messaging. They're calling this a nationwide month of action 
as they're trying to drive up that vaccination rate before the 4th of July holiday. Now, after Tuesday's announcement that the U.S. is most likely not going to meet that goal, First Lady Jill Biden traveled to some of the southern states where the vaccination rates are much lower. She visited um, Jackson State University in Mississippi. She stopped by a COVID-19 vaccination site there, encouraging people to roll up their sleeves and get the shot. See, she also joined with American country music star Brad Paisley at a distillery in Nashville, Tennessee, encouraging people to get vaccinated. And on Thursday, President Joe Biden traveled to North Carolina, also rolling, uh, also encouraging Americans to roll up their sleeves. Also on Thursday, the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, appeared on the ABC network here in the U.S. She wanted to explain the benefits of the vaccine for young adults, that they outweigh the risks. This came one day after the CDC and other health organizations issued a rare joint statement where they stressed the overriding benefits of the vaccines, calling instances of heart inflammation after Pfizer and Moderna vaccinations extremely rare. This problem appears to be most common in young men after their second shot, but it's nevertheless very, is nevertheless rare overall. So the CDC here in the U.S. is still recommending that young people, as young as 12 years old, continue to get vaccinated. Right, Amy, my final question for you. We know that the Delta variant of coronavirus is spreading across the world. In fact, even the WHO has sounded an alarm against the same. So how much of a risk does the Delta variant pose in the United States at this time? Well, appearing on NBC News, Dr. Anthony Fauci said he expects to see that Delta variant of the coronavirus become quite dominant here in this country within several weeks to a month. And as you realize, that's very concerning as the Delta variant is easily transmissible. Fauci described the Delta variant as, quote, the greatest threat in the U.S. to our attempt to eliminate COVID-19. He said that at a White House briefing on the virus. So obviously this is something that health officials are tracking very closely. It's definitely a concern. The uh, incidence of the Delta variant are as high as 20% in the U.S. Now the good news is Fauci said that our vaccines are effective against the Delta variant. So that's why health experts are really stressing the importance of people getting fully vaccinated, not just one shot with Pfizer or Moderna, but getting both shots. And a new Associated Press analysis of available government data shows that nearly all of the COVID-19 deaths in the U.S. now are in people who were not vaccinated. That's why we're going to continue to see President Biden push this message and encourage Americans to get vaccinated, even if they do miss that July 4th deadline. Right, Amy, we leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us on this special broadcast of the We On VOA co-production. And thank you for all your insights.